Man exists amid the universal ferment of being, and not only needs plasticity in its habits and pursuits, but finds plasticity also in the surrounding world. Life is an equilibrium, which is maintained now by accepting modification, and now by imposing it. Since the organ for all activity is a body in mechanical relation to other material objects, objects which the creature's instincts often compel him to appropriate or transform changes in his habits and pursuits leave their mark on whatever he touches. His habitat must needs bear many a trace of his presence, from which intelligent observers might infer something about his life and action. The vestiges of action are for the most part imprinted unconsciously and aimlessly on the world. They are in themselves generally useless, like footprints. And yet, almost any sign of man's passage might, under certain conditions, interest a man. A footprint could fill Robinson Crusoe with emotion. The devastation wrought by an army's march might prove many things to a historian, and even the disorder in which a room is casually left may express very vividly the owner's ways and character. Sometimes, however, man's traces are traces of useful action which has so changed natural objects as to make them congenial to his mind. Instead of a footprint, you might find an arrow. Instead of a disordered room, a well-planted orchard. Things which would not only have betrayed the agent's habits, but would have served and expressed his intent. Such propitious forms given by man to matter are no less instrumental in the life of reason than are propitious forms assumed by man's own habit or fancy. Any operation which thus humanizes and rationalizes objects is called art. All art has an instructive source and a material embodiment. If the birds in building nests felt the utility of what they do, they would be practicing an art. And for the instinct to be called rational, it would even suffice that their traditional purpose and method should become conscious occasionally. Thus weaving is an art, although the weaver may not be at every moment conscious of its purpose, but may be carried along like any other workman by the routine of his art. And language is a rational product, not because it always has a use or meaning, but because it is sometimes felt to have one. Arts are no less automatic than instincts, and usually, as Aristotle observed, less thoroughly purposive. For instincts, being transmitted by inheritance and embedded in congenital structure, have to be economically and deeply organized. If they go far wrong, they constitute a burden impossible to throw off and impossible to bear. The man harassed by inordinate instincts perishes through want, vice, disease, or madness. Arts, on the contrary, being transmitted only by imitation and teaching, hover more lightly over life. If ill-adjusted, they make less havoc and cause less drain. The more superficial they are, and the more detached from practical habits, the more extravagant and meaningless they can dare to become. 
so that the higher products of life are the most often gratuitous. No instinct or intuition was ever so absurd as is a large part of human poetry and philosophy, while the margin of ineptitude is much broader in religious myth than in religious ethics. Arts or instincts bred and reared in the open, creative habits acquired in the light of reason. Consciousness accompanies their formation. A certain uneasiness or desire in a more or less definite conception of what is wanted often precedes their full organization. That the need should be felt before the means for satisfying it have been found has led the unreflecting to imagine that in art the need produces the discovery and the idea of the work causes at best are lightly assigned by mortals and this particular superstition is no worse than any other the data the plan and its execution has conjoined empirically in a few interesting cases which show successful achievement are made into a law in oblivion of the fact that in more numerous cases such conjunction fails wholly or in part and that even in the successful cases other natural conditions are present and must be present to secure the result in a matter where custom is so ingrained and supported by a constant apperceptive illusion there is little hope of making thought suddenly exact or exact language not paradoxical. We must observe, however, that only by virtue of false perspective do ideas seem to govern action, or is a felt necessity the mother of invention. In truth, invention is a child of abundance and the genius or vital premonition and groping which achieve art simultaneously achieve the ideas which that art embodies. Or, rather, ideas are themselves products of an inner movement which has an automatic extension outwards, and this extension manifests the ideas. Mere craving has no lights of its own prophesied by no prescience of what the world may contain and would satisfy, no power of imagining what would allay its unrest. Images and satisfactions have to come of themselves, then the blind craving as it turns into an incipient pleasure first recognizes its object. The pure will's impotence is absolute, and it would writhe forever and consume itself in darkness if perception gave it no light and experience no premonition. Now, a man cannot draw bodily from external perception the ideas he is supposed to create or invent. And as his will or uneasiness before he creates the satisfying ideas is by hypothesis without them, it follows that creation or invention is automatic. The ideas come of themselves, being new and unthought of figments, similar, no doubt, to old perceptions and compacted of familiar materials but reproduced in a novel fashion and dropping in their sudden form from the blue. However instantly they may be welcomed, they are not already known and never could have been summoned. 
the stock example, for instance, of groping for a forgotten name, we know the context in which that name should lie. We feel the environment of our local void. What finally pops into that place, reinstated there by the surrounding tensions, is itself unforeseen. For it was just this that was forgotten. Could we have invoked the name, we should not have needed to do so. Having it already at our disposal. It is, in fact, a palpable impossibility that any idea should call itself into being, or that any act or any preference should be its own ground. The responsibility assumed for these things is not a determination to conceive them before they are conceived, which is a contradiction in terms, but an embrace and appropriation of them once they have appeared. It is thus that evolutions and parts of our nature become touchstones for the whole. And the incidents within us seem hardly our own work till they are accepted and incorporated into the main current of our being. All invention is sensitive, all art experimental, and to be sought like salvation with fear and trembling. There is a painful pregnancy in genius, a long incubation and waiting for the spirit, a thousand rejections and futile birth pangs. Even the wonderful child appears, the gift of the gods, utterly undeserved and inexplicably perfect. Even this unaccountable success comes only in rare and fortunate instances. What is ordinarily produced is so base a hybrid, so lame and ridiculous a changeling, that we reconcile ourselves with difficulty to our offspring and blush to be represented by our faded works. The propensity to attribute happy events to our own agency, little as we understand what we mean by it, and to attribute only untoward results to external forces, has its ground in the primitive nexus of experience. What we call ourselves is a certain cycle of vegetative processes bringing a round of familiar impulses and ideas. This stream has a general direction, a conscious vital inertia in harmony with which it moves. Many of the developments within it are dialectical. That is, they go forward by inner necessity, like an egg hashing within its shell warmed but undisturbed by an environment of which they are wholly oblivious. And this sort of growth, when there is adequate consciousness of it, is felt to be both absolutely obvious and absolutely free. The emotion that accompanies it is pleasurable, but is too active and proud to call itself a pleasure. It has rather the quality of assurance and right. This part of life, however, is only its courageous core. About it play all sorts of incidental processes, of laying themselves to it in more or less incongruous movement. Whatever peripheral events fall in with the central impulse are accordingly lost and synergy, and felt to be not so much peripheral and accidental as inwardly grounded, being like the stages of a prosperous dialectic, spontaneously demanded and instantly justified when they come. The sphere of the self's power is accordingly, for primitive consciousness, simply the sphere of what happens well. It is the entire 
unoffending and obedient part of the world. A man who has good luck at dice prides himself upon it and believes that to have it is his destiny and desert. If his luck were absolutely constant, he would say he had the power to throw high. And as the event would, by hypothesis, sustain his boast, there would be no practical error in that assumption. A will that never found anything to thwart it would think itself omnipotent. And as the psychological essence of omniscience is not to suspect that there is anything which you do not know, so the psychological essence of omnipotence is not to suspect that anything can happen which you do not desire. Such claims would undoubtedly be made if experience lent them the least color, but would even the most comfortable and innocent assurances of the sort cease to be precarious? Might not any moment of eternity bring the unimagined contradiction and shake the dreaming God? Utility, like significance, is an eventual harmony in the arts and by no means their ground. All useful things have been discovered as the Lilliputians discovered roast pig. And the casual feat has furthermore to be supported by a situation favorable to maintaining the art. The most useful act will never be repeated unless its secret remains embodied in structure. Practice and endeavor will not help an artist to remain long at his best, and many a performance is applauded which cannot be imitated. To create the requisite structure, two performed structures are needed, one in the agent to give him skill and perseverance, and another in the material to give it the right plasticity. Human progress would long ago have reached its goal if every man could recognize the good, could at once appropriate it, and possess wisdom forever by virtue of one moment's insight. Insight, unfortunately, is in itself perfectly useless and inconsequential. It can neither have produced its own occasion nor now ensure its own recurrence. Nevertheless, being proof positive that whatever basis it needs is actual, insight is also an indication that the extant structure, if circumstances maintain it, may continue to operate with the same moral results, maintaining the vision which it has once supported. When men find that by chance they have started a useful change in the world, they congratulate themselves upon it and call their persistence in that practice a free activity. And the activity is indeed rational since it subserves an end. The happy organization which enables us to continue in that rational course is the very organization which enabled us to initiate it. If this new process was formed under external influences, the same influences, when they operate again, will reconstitute the process each time more easily, while if it was formed spontaneously, its own inertia will maintain it quietly in the brain and bring it to the surface whenever circumstances permit. This is what is called learning by experience. Such lessons are far from indelible and are not always at command. Yet, what has once been done may be repeated. Repetition reinforces itself and becomes habit. And a clear memory 
of the benefit once attained by fortunate action, representing, as it does, the trace left by the action in the system and its harmony with the man's usual impulses. For the action is felt to be beneficial, constitutes a strong presumption that the act will be repeated automatically on occasion, i.e., that it has really been learned. Consciousness, which willingly attends to results only, will judge either the memory or the benefit, or both confusedly, to be the ground of this readiness to act. And only if some hitch occurs in the machinery, so that rational behavior fails to take place, will a surprise appeal be made to material accidents, or to a guilty forgetfulness or indocility in the soul. The idiot cannot learn from experience at all, because a new process in his liquid brain does not modify a structure, while the fool uses what he has learned only inaptly and in frivolous fragments, because his stretches of linked experience are short and their connections insecure. But when the cerebral plasm is fresh and well disposed, and when the paths are clear, attention is consecutive and learning easy. A multitude of details can be gathered into a single cycle of memory or of potential regard. Under such circumstances, Action is the unimpeded expression of healthy instinct in an environment squarely faced. Conduct from the first, then issues in progress. And by reinforcing its own organization at each rehearsal makes progress continual. For there will subsist not only a readiness to act, and a great precision in action. But if any significant circumstance has varied in the conditions or in the interests at stake, this change will make itself felt. It will check the process and prevent precipitate action. Deliberation or well-founded scruple has the same source as facility, a plastic and quick organization. To be sensitive to difficulties and dangers goes with being sensitive to opportunities. Of all reasons and embodiments, art is therefore the most splendid and complete, merely to attain categories by which inner experience may be articulated, or to feign analogies by which a universe may be conceived, would be but a visionary triumph if it remained ineffectual and wet with no actual remodeling of the outer world to render man's dwelling more appropriate and his mind better fed and more largely transmissible. Mind grows self perpetuating only by its expression in matter. What makes progress possible is that rational action may leave traces in nature, such that nature, in consequence, furnishes a better basis for the life of reason. In other words, progress is art bettering the conditions of existence until art arises. All achievement is internal to the brain, dies with the individual, and even in him, spends itself without recovery, like music heard in a dream. Art, in establishing instruments for human life,
your own human body, embody our themes into sympathy with inner values, establishes a ground whence values may continually spring up. The thatch that protects from today's rain will last and keep out tomorrow's rain also. The sign that once expresses an idea will serve to recall it in future. Not only does the work of art thus perpetuate its own function and produce a better experience, but the process of art also perpetuates itself because it is teachable. Every animal learns something by living, but if its offspring inherit only what he possessed at birth, they have to learn life's lessons over again from the beginning. With at best some vague help given by their parents' example. But when the fruits of experience exist in the common environment, when new instruments unknown to nature are offered to each individual for its better equipment, although he must still learn for himself how to live, he may learn in a humane school where artificial occasions are constantly open to him for expanding his powers, it is no longer merely hidden inner processes that he must reproduce to attain his predecessor's wisdom. He may acquire much of it more expediously by imitating their outward habit, an imitation which, furthermore, they have some means of exalting from him. Wherever there is art, there is a possibility of training. A father who calls his idle sons from the jungle to help him hold the plow not only endures them to labor, but compels them to observe the earth upturned and refreshed and to watch the germination there. Their wandering thought, their incipient rebellions will be met by the hope of harvest, and it will not be impossible for them, when their father is dead, to follow the plow of their own initiative, and for their own children's sake. So great is the sustained advance in rationality made possible by art, which, being embodied in matter, is teachable and transmissible by training. For an art, body is secured or recognized more readily for having been first enjoyed when other people furnish the means to them, while the maintenance of these values is facilitated by an external tradition imposing itself contagiously or by force on each new generation. Art is action which, transcending the body, makes the world a more congenial stimulus to the soul. All art is therefore useful and practical, and the notable aesthetic value which some works of art possess for reasons flowing, for the most part, out of their moral significance, is itself one of the satisfactions which art offers to human nature as a whole. Between sensation and abstract discourse lies a region of deployed sensibility or synthetic representation, a region where more is seen at arm's length than in any one moment could be felt at close quarters, and yet where the remote parts of experience which discourse reaches only through symbols are covered and recomposed in something like their native colors and experience relations. This region, called imagination, has pleasures more airy and luminous than those of sense, more massive and rapturous than those of intelligence. The values 
inherent in imagination, in instant intuition, and in sense endowed with form, are called aesthetic values. They are found mainly in nature and living beings, but often also in man's artificial works and images evoked by languages and in the realm of sound. Productions in which an aesthetic value is or is supposed to be prominent take the name of fine art, but the work of fine art so defined is almost always an abstraction from the actual object, which has many non-aesthetic functions and values. To separate the aesthetic element, abstract and dependent, as it often is, is an artifice which is more misleading than helpful, for neither in the history of art nor in a rational estimate of its value can the aesthetic function of things be divorced from the practical and moral. What had to be done was, by imaginative races, done imaginatively. What had to be spoken or made was spoken or made fitly, lovingly, beautifully. Or to take the matter up on a psychological side, the ceaseless experimentation confirmment of ideas in breeding what it had a propensity to breed came sometimes on figments that gave it delightful pause. These beauties were the first knowledges, and these arrests the first hints of real and useful things. The rose's grace could more easily be plucked from its petals than the beauty of art from its subject, occasion, and use. An aesthetic fragrance, indeed, all things may have, if in soliciting man's senses or reason, they can awaken his imagination as well. But this middle zone is so mixed and nebulous, and its limits are so vague, that it cannot well be treated in theory otherwise than as it exists in fact. As a phase of man's sympathy with the world he moves in. If art is that element in a life of reason, which consists in modifying its environment the better to attain its end, art may be expected to subserve all parts of the human ideal, to increase man's comfort, knowledge, and delight, and as nature, in her measure, is want to satisfy these interests together. So art in seeking to increase that satisfaction will work simultaneously in every ideal direction, nor will any of these directions be on the whole good or tempt a well-trained will if it leads to estrangement from all other interests. The aesthetic good will be accordingly hatched in the same nest with the others and incapable of flying far in different air.